A little over two months ago, I reviewed the Panasonic S1, and in that video, I said this. So I'll probably come back to this down the road, and then we can do an actual one-to-one -one comparison. And also by that time, there might be the video upgrade firmware available as well. Well, that time has come. I've got the matching lenses, I've got the firmware, and I've got some test results to show you. Let's get undone. Gerald Undone. He's crazy. What's happening, everybody? I'm Gerald Undone, and there's only one thing we say to death. Not today. All right, so let's talk about what's new since the last time I covered the S1. But I still recommend that you go and watch my previous review because a lot of that information still stands and I'm not gonna waste all of your time by repeating everything from that video. And just like with the last video, I need to thank Camera Canada again for lending me all of the test subjects that we used in this video, including the lenses, the adapters, and the Panasonic S1 itself. So make sure you show them some love for making this video possible by checking out their links in the description below. Okay, so first up, I've got version 1.2 of the firmware installed in here, which brings alleged improvements to the autofocus and and the in-body image stabilization. I tried to see if I could notice an improvement to the IBIS, which is apparently improved by half a stop, but I just couldn't tell. But that's a good thing. The IBIS was already pretty amazing on this camera. I was able to get surprisingly low shutter speeds and the handheld video was great. And testing it again now, the same is true. It's not noticeably different in my opinion, but it's still excellent. As for the autofocus improvements, the tracking is supposed to be better, and they've added some new AF on functions that you can map to custom buttons of your choosing. One of them is far shift AF on, and the other one is near shift AF on. This is to prioritize a range to focus on. It's basically like a focus limiter, but rather than cutting off the near or far end like a limiter would, it just prioritizes the range that you want when holding the button. Now, I did notice an improvement when using the tracking and with the new AF on buttons. For the autofocus tests, I used the kit lens, the Panasonic 24 to 105 f4, and when comparing it against the Sony, I got a similar lens on the Sony, there, 24 to 105 f4. I also set both cameras to prioritize focus when shooting in burst mode, just like last time, and I also use the same focus mode so that we could see if the usable keeper rate has improved since the last time we did these tests. Last time, the S1 averaged around 4.5 frames per second usable and reached as high as 5.3 frames per second in one of the tests, where the Sony did much better. This time, the Sony still did better, but the S1 saw up to a 25% improvement in certain modes. The lock-on tracking and the standard expandable focus box were about the same, but maybe a little bit better on the S1 this time around, reaching 4.8 and 4.9 usable frames per second. But the face and eye detection mode reached up to 5.9 seconds, which is a noticeable bump and very close to the max advertised spec of 6 frames per second, but with all 6 of those shots being sharp. The new near shift and far shift modes were a bit of a mixed bag actually. The far shift mode didn't really make a difference for me and still we saw that 4.5 to 4.8 frames per second. But the near shift mode had a significant improvement and now reached 6.3 frames per second, the newest high that I've ever tested on this camera. And it was the only mode to get all the shots of me in focus when I got really close to the lens. Perhaps the far shift just wasn't being utilized well in my test scenario. Maybe if I had a longer lens with the subject much farther away, we would see better results, like with a 70 to 200. But with the 24 to 105, I didn't find that far shift was that much better than just pressing AF on regularly. But either way, this is a nice little improvement for the S1, and it definitely makes it a viable action camera now. Now we just need some more lenses to come out that are better suited for that purpose. The Sony still won the matchup, but only when set to its highest speed. When both cameras were set to their high setting, the Sony was actually slower than the S1, only getting about 3.6 usable frames per second. But the Sony has a high plus setting that can easily double the previous result. When using the wide open focus box with the latest firmware and the high plus setting, I was able to get at least 7.6 frames per second usable at the lowest. And when I used the lock-on tracking, which works much better on the Sony than it does on the Panasonic, I got 9.5 frames per second sharp on average. So on the S1, the face and eye detection had the best results in my tests, where on the Sony, the lock-on tracking is still king. But both cameras are usable, the main difference is that the Sony has the lenses and that it's still a cheaper body, so if action sports is your game, then the Sony is still the better buy. I was also able to finally do an apples to apples image quality comparison, which I promised in the last video because now I can use similar lenses. I still don't have the Sigma L mount lenses that were supposed to come out for the Panasonic, they might still be a while yet, but I do have the MC21 adapter, which allows me to put the same Canon mount Sigma lens on both bodies. Now the MC21 is pretty limited and doesn't allow for continuous AF, so this is purely an image quality comparison. So here's the two images, both raw photos, both at ISO 800, both at 35 millimeter at f2.5 and 1 1 25th of a second. And if we zoom right into the center here, we can see they look pretty much identical in my opinion. And all the way across the color renditions, 
pretty much everything about this image is exactly the same. Now, if we just take a quick look at these images uncorrected, we can see the actual differences, but these are really easy to fix. The first one is just with white balance. So I set Kelvin to the same on both of these images, but the first one here, as you can tell, is at 4,900 and plus three. And if we switch over to the other one, it's 5,150 and plus eight. And if you look at them, you can see a slight shift in the white balance where the one is a little bit warmer and more magenta. The other difference is in the way that the ISOs are measured. So if I reset the exposure here, remember that on the Panasonic, it's still at ISO 800, but if I switch back to the Sony, the Sony is brighter than the Panasonic, and I found that we needed to bump it about two-thirds of a stop to get it to look identical to the Sony. But as I was saying, the rest of the image is pretty much identical when it comes to sharpness and resolution and rendition and detail. It's very, very hard to tell apart. So basically, when you use the same lens, the photo image quality is going to be nearly identical between these two cameras. But there are some differences in video quality because another thing that comes along with version 1.2 of the firmware is the ability to activate the paid vlog upgrade. Now this upgrade will give you a couple things. First, it adds waveforms, which is pretty cool, but I've always found that these Panasonic waveforms to be a little bit too small to be completely useful, but they're great to have if you have nothing else. And it also adds a whole section of codec options that weren't there before. To enable them, you have to choose MOV as the container. Before this upgrade, MOV wasn't even a container option, but now it's the container that stores all of the 10-bit options. Because you can now record 10-bit 422 internally on pretty much every frame rate and resolution combination if you get the V-Log upgrade. Except for 4K60, you can record 10-bit 422, but only externally you can only do the 8-bit 420 internally at 4K60. And the 4K60 still has the 1.5 times crop, even if you get the V-Log upgrade. That hasn't changed. And another thing that hasn't changed is the variable frame rate, you know, the built-in slow motion recording. Unfortunately, it still doesn't allow you to change any of your exposure settings when you enable that mode. So you're still better off just recording in a high frame rate and then slowing it down in post. Lastly, and probably most importantly to a lot of people, it also brings the V-Log with the V-Gamut color, which apparently is supposed to be the same V-Log that you would find in the Vericam and EVA1 cameras, rather than the V-Log L that we're used to seeing in the smaller cameras. The main difference here being the exposure clipping point, which we'll get into in a minute, as well as the wider color space and hopefully more stops of dynamic range. Now, I did compare it both in 10-bit and 8-bit V-Log on the S1 against the 8-bit S-Log2 of the Sony a7 III. And I found that when exposed correctly and corrected to the same level, we get very similar images, just like we did with the raw photos. I did notice a shift in hue, however, between the 8-bit and 10-bit versions on the Panasonic across all my tests, with the 8-bit being more magenta and the 10-bit being a bit greener. Now I corrected these without a LUT by manually applying a curve so I could make a determination on which one I preferred to work with, and I would say that they both did fine. The V-Log might have been a tad easier and more intuitive by using just a simple exaggerated S-curve, where the Sony needed to be pulled back in the highlights more so, and this might not be that intuitive to some, but this does carry some advantages that we'll discuss later on. One note on getting proper exposure with the S1's V-Log though, as I mentioned it's different than the GH5 or GH5S or GH4 or something you might have been used to working with, it now has a higher maximum brightness clipping point. I shined a bright light at the sensor to see where the clipping point was, and I checked this in Premiere, and it was falling, I would say, around 80, just above 85%, and then I popped it open in DaVinci Resolve, which has better scopes, in my opinion, and we can see that it's lying on the 896 line, which is about 87.5%. It might be a little bit lower than that, so this is much closer, as promised, to the EVA1 and the Vericam. And so basically, if you're somebody who likes to expose to the right, this means that you're going to want to set your zebras to about 80 85%, so that way if you use that as your guide for your maximum clipping, anything above 85% will likely to be out of range and will clip, where on S-Log2 on the Sony, you can set that much higher. Now this doesn't mean that one is better than the other, just that you have to respect each camera's exposure settings in order to achieve the maximum dynamic range on each of those systems. And just to show this in a bit more practical of a situation, if we have a shot here that was exposed using the 85% ETTR, and then if we apply a LUT over here that will convert it to Rec. 709, we can see that the all the levels just immediately go into spec and the image looks great. Our 90% white is falling right around 90% and so on as it works its way down and we get pretty close to zero with the reflective black. So it's as easy as that as long as you ETTR, but for this case it's 85% that you're going to want to use for the new V-Log. And here's just some scaling chips to show you that when you expose for each camera correctly with the Panasonic and V-Log and the Sony on S-Log2 that they match each other very closely and you'll get very similar results.
Now the S1 has the advantage of being 10-bit if you buy the V-Log upgrade. So let's see that in action first by putting an extreme grade on our scene and pushing the colors to their limits. Okay, so this is what the shot looks like with the extreme grade on it. Now if we look over here on these chips on the left-hand side, we can see a pretty good example of what happened. So this is Panasonic's 8-bit V-Log, and we can see that this particular color chip has completely fallen apart. And if we go over to the Sony 8-bit S-Log, it did okay on this chip, better than the Panasonic did, but the darker color and this one here, I would say, are having a lot of issues. Now if we switch over to the 10-bit V-Log, we can see that despite the same extreme grade that all of those color chips that both the 8-bit and the Sony version were having trouble with is pretty good now. I mean, it's still probably a bit too extreme for this, but that's basically how you can see the difference. 10-bit, 8-bit. So if you are somebody that likes to put an extreme grade on something, you'll definitely see the advantage of the 10-bit here. I don't know how well this is gonna translate over to YouTube with the compression and the fact that everything is gonna be 8-bit probably when you're watching it. But I do have another example here that we can take a look at. And for this one, I basically made a blue gradient across the frame to see how, see what the banding was gonna be like and how the colors rolled out. And if we look at all three together here, so they're labeled, so the 8-bit of the S1's on top, the 10-bit of the S1's in the middle, and then the A7 III is on the bottom. Again, I don't know how well this is gonna translate, but let's just have a look here, and I will tell you what I see. So as the light starts to come across, for me, what I can see, you're just gonna have to take my word for it in case it didn't translate, is that the S1 8-bit, there is a clear line here that's kind of distorted too, and this is basically one color of blue, and then about a second color of blue, and then a third color of blue, it's basically about three tones. And and the A7 III has a similar effect, but again, I think the A7 III's 8-bit is better than the S1's 8-bit, honestly. But it's the same idea. We kind of have like one to two tones. It's, it's a pretty lame gradient, but this whole section here is basically a light gradient of blue. And then we have a darker blue over here that has the same effect. I like it better than the 8-bit uh, S1 though. But on the 10-bit S1, we have you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I would say anywhere from eight to ten variations of that blue, and it's much smoother, where, you know, this line here isn't as corrupted as the 8 bit version. So the S1 in 10 bit definitely wins there, but the Sony fights back when it comes to color accuracy. So if we take a look here, I've got the six chips from the scene with the saturation bumped a little bit, and then we're looking over here on the vector scope to see how well they line up with the target colors for accuracy. And right away we can see that Panasonic, whether on 8-bit or 10-bit, which you can see look pretty much the same, suffers from Panasonic's somewhat famous green problem, where the green chip is not really well aligned and neither really is the cyan one with where they should be. But if we jump over to the Sony 8-bit S-Log, we can see that the green, while still not perfect, most of the colors do a much better job, both in you know evenness on their saturation and also bringing the green and cyan more into spec. So the Sony definitely wins when it comes to color accuracy. I've said this many times before, there's a lot of people that argue about the Sony not being that color accurate, but as you can see here, when using this chart, for instance, the Sony sensor is actually quite color accurate. Whether you like the way it looks or not is completely subjective and up to you. By the way, while I have this set up here, if you want to see yet another reason why I recommend the Leaminglets, look what they do to the Panasonic colors. Pretty much fixes everything, and I would say almost every color is falling exactly where it should be. And this is with the exact same scene. I didn't do anything other than put the Leaminglet on the Panasonic. Now, if we put this all together in a real-world shooting environment, we can clearly see each camera's advantages come to life. Here we have a shot that requires a wide dynamic range with the subject in shadow, but balanced exposure designed to keep the sky intact. Here's what it looks like on the Sony using S-Log2, completely uncorrected, and then the Panasonic using V-Log, same thing, uncorrected. And you'll have to excuse the little particles on my sensor. It was a windy day and not ideal for changing lenses outside. And because I stopped these all the way down to like F18 or something like that in order to balance the exposure without using an ND filter because that would add another layer of complexity to the tests, when you stop down that much, every little speck on your sensor becomes pretty obvious in the final image. So please forgive that. Anyway, if we correct this image to equal levels on both cameras, attempting to evenly recover the shadows and the highlights for the widest range image, we get this. The Sony, again, wins out for color rendition and highlight detail, but it suffers from more banding. Again, I don't know if you can see this, but the Sony has this rippled banding effect all the way across. I can see distinct lines where it changes shades of blue. 
And this is a practical sky example and not just some gradient that I made with the light. The S1, on the other hand, doesn't have that banding issue at all, but it wasn't able to recover as much sky. And this has to do with that highlight changing in the curve that I was talking about earlier in the way that the Sony handles the highlights versus the way that the V-Log handles the highlights. And also, raising the shadows, the same mount that we did on the Sony, led to more color shifting issues on the Panasonic, which again led to a more color accurate image on the Sony. However, when we raise the exposure to favor the subject in shadow, me, underneath the tree, the tables turn. The Panasonic no longer has its color problems because we don't have to cook the shadows as much and now looks very similar to the Sony for rendition. But somehow, the Panasonic managed to keep its sky the way it was before we raised the exposure without losing any more of it, where the Sony definitely lost a decent amount of highlight detail from that increased exposure and it still suffers from the banding. Now, in both cases, both images were very usable, but you need to ask yourself what kind of shooting and grading you like to do, and then choose a system that matches that workflow. Lastly, let's take one final look at autofocus, but this time for video. I wanted to see if any of the improvements to the AF translated over to the video side, but unfortunately, they didn't. I recorded myself simultaneously on the S1, the a7 III, and the GH5 for five minutes using each of their native standard zoom lenses with balanced AF settings and using face detection. And I moved around to see which cameras would lose focus and when, and the S1 clearly performed the worst of the three. Now this is different than the pop in and pop out and walking at the camera test that I did last time and that you see all over the internet. This is more for talking head or vlogging reliability while also looking at background pulsing. Now the GH5 did surprisingly well and held focus in many situations where the S1 didn't and the a7 III dominated. It almost never lost focus and also doesn't suffer from the pulsing problems that contrast AF has. And when we take a closer look at the pulsing, I think we can see why the GH5 outperforms the S1. It pulses much faster seemingly, which you may like or dislike, but it keeps the subject in focus more effectively. The S1 pulses slower, but loses focus more often and for longer. And the a7 III doesn't pulse at all and is the clear winner with very reliable AF performance in video. All right, so that's all the updates and results. So let's do a quick summary recap. The version 1.2 firmware for the S1 does improve the autofocus performance for photos, making the S1 a viable camera for action photography. We just need more lenses. It did not help the video AF though, which is still dominated by the phase detection competition when it comes to reliability, and the GH5 actually performed better than the S1 in my tests. The image quality between the S1 and the a7 III is nearly identical when it comes to shooting raw photos with the same lens. The new paid vlog upgrade is great and adds a lot of useful features to video, most importantly the 10-bit recording options, which when combined with vlog gives you a very flexible image which can take harsh shooting conditions and intense grading with ease. When corrected the same, the Sony's S Log 2 and the Panasonic's V-Log can look quite similar. The Sony is a bit more color accurate, but it suffers from banding that the S1 just doesn't have. You can fix the colors in post if you have time, but you can't really fix 8-bit into 10-bit. Overall, I'd say it's a well-fought match. Both cameras are fantastic. Now, I wouldn't exactly call the Panasonic S1 an upgrade over the Sony, but if you own neither of these cameras and you're looking to get into one of these systems, you can't really go wrong. Go with the Sony if autofocus is the most important thing, and go with the Panasonic if ergonomics or flexibility is the most important. But that's gonna be it for me. I hope you found this video helpful or at least entertaining. And if you did, make sure you leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, Feel free to hit the dislike button twice. All right, I'm done.